ho, 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 righty then. Let's have a talk about the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk and the critical issue of peace. And it really was a critical issue. Lenin wrote in September 1917 to secure a truce at present means to conquer the whole world. And he he's being somewhat facetious, but what he was referencing there was the how important the issue of peace was, that that would forward the revolutionary movement, um, would undermine imperialist capitalism. Uh, it, that idea of peace was linking in with that a slogan that I revolutionary ideal that turning the imperialist war into a civil war, a class war, and that whole explanation of the conflict as one that was about capitalist imperialism and how that needed to come to an end if socialism was to be achieved. It was about that explanation that Lenin gave to Russia's workers that they'd been tricked into fighting this war that really had nothing to do for them, and that applied to workers across the world. Now, that idea of peace bred land, we'll go back to the peace bit, that was a real critical issue that helped gather popular support for the Bolsheviks. And when coming to power, they needed to deliver on this idea. And at the tail end of the October Revolution, one of the decrees that Lenin read out was that decree on peace. And that was met with widespread popular support amongst soldiers and workers and peasants. So realising that idea was an important aspect that underpinned the legitimacy of the new government. Now, Lenin saw the issue of peace as also being critical for stabilising the new revolutionary regime uh, and giving the, the October Revolution time to develop. And the other element too, that passing that decree on peace, that wasn't a peace treaty as such, that was simply a declaration that they were going to aim to achieve one at the soonest possible moment. And therefore for Lenin, peace had to come as quickly as possible, immediately and at any cost. And you get these extraordinary statements by Lenin where he says, I spit on Russia. That sounds quite, you know, what is he doing there? What he's referencing is, I spit on Russia, this is merely one phase through which we must pass on the way to world revolution, meaning that Russia as a country is only a stepping stone to revolution. So an initial ceasefire was negotiated on the 2nd of December 1917. However, the question of peace was one that divided the Bolshevik leadership. We've already outlined the uh, position that was Lenin's, and that it is immediate peace as soon as possible. But there was another quite influential group led by Nikolai Bukharin. Nikolai Bukharin headed a faction called the Left Communists, and they were aligned with the Left SRs, who, as we've discussed previously, had entered the government of Narcom in December 1917. For Bukharin and his comrades on the left, they saw that a agreement with Germany would be an endorsement of imperialism, a giving in to foul ideas uh, uh, it would be encouraging that imperialist conflict further it would be a win for Germany and so therefore their position was one of revolutionary war continue the war but it's got a different frame a different uh, spin to it that Germany would eventually of course then invade Russia but that would overstretch German forces Russian workers and soldiers would fight a protracted guerrilla warfare campaign and that would uh, ultimately lead to the defeat of Germany. It would be very difficult, but it would be better than signing an imperialist agreement with Germany. Lenin thought that was obscene, terrible. He called that an infantile disorder. You know, what, what a babyish, irresponsible thing to do. Lenin made the comparison of being up the doff, so to speak, that, that Russia had given birth to a healthy socialist revolution, whereas Germany, in Lenin's words, was only pregnant with the possibility of revolution. Um, Trotsky offers the third position. So we've got Lenin's idea of immediate peace, Bukharin's idea of imperialist war. Trotsky had a third way, which he devised as stated to be neither peace nor war. And Trotsky's 
influence here is quite critical because as the Commissar for Foreign Affairs, he was the chief negotiator for the peace agreements at the Polish town of Brest-Litovsk. Now, his role here is very important. If you're looking at the role of Trotsky, his contributions of, as Commissar for Foreign Affairs at Brest-Litovsk are important. So he was there negotiating uh, from December into fe uh, January and into February. And in pursuing this neither peace nor war, he, he never articulated that to the Germans, but it was certainly what he was wanting to do. What he was trying to do was make the peace negotiations go for as long as possible in order to provide time for a revolutionary movement to unfold elsewhere. It's already in R Russia. He's expecting it to be likely soon to be happening in Germany. So he carried on in a quite extraordinary fashion. He would get long theatrical speeches, uh, ones that would go for hours and that were very difficult to follow. And, you know, Trotsky was an extraordinary speaker, so they would be, you know, they would be probably quite entertaining if, if you liked him. Very frustrating for the Germans. And he'd be on the point of, he'd have the piece of paper ready to sign it. Oh, no, just let's talk about it a little bit more. So went on and on. He'd contradict himself and... In addition to that, in, in addition to protracting, extending the negotiations, Trotsky also quite extraordinarily appealed to the German people, so went above, or below, not above, below the German government uh, in, in, in trying to put pressure on German authorities to agree to peace um, and, to, and also to inflame revolutionary sentiment in Germany. And at the same time, Russian soldiers fraternized, so spoke with German soldiers, uh, you know, and they explained how we're comrades and the, explained to them what had happened in Russia, how they turned on their officers and had a, had a revolution, baby. Um, this went on and on, and Trotsky believed that his tactics were paying off because if you've studied German history, things were getting a little cray-cray in 1918, 1919. That's in Germany. The German negotiators were at first baffled, perplexed. They couldn't understand what was going on. They were disturbed. Hindenburg described Trotsky as having you know, as antics that were like, what did he say, degraded the conference table to the level of a tub thumper street corner. So that's the kind of, you know, get them here, hot chips, paper, but, you know, that sort of kind of thing. Um, it didn't make any sense to the Germans the way that the Russians were behaving because l Russia had lost the war, but the the Russians were behaving like they were winners. And in, the, in their mindset, they kind of were because they had a socialist revolution. They were expecting worldwide socialist revolution to unfold sometime soon. But to the Germans, this made most mo make no sense whatsoever. Got to the point where finally the Germans drew you know, like a line in the sand, if you will, and said, right, that's enough. Sign this agreement or else the German military will invade Russia. Trotsky then, carrying that principle of neither peace nor war, did something that absolutely initially blew the Germans out of the way. He said, yep, we are no longer negotiating, but we're not going to agree to a peace agreement, but we're not going to fight the war essentially, you know, adopting that idea of formalising neither peace nor war. And what is that? You can't have a peace treaty if you've agreed to a peace treaty. So that bought them a little bit of time, and then the Germans went, nah, nah, and launched an invasion. So key significant date is the 18th of February, 1918, when the Germans slammed 700,000 troops you know, into the Russian border, and they continued to advance with no resistance, you know, really whatsoever. The Russian military was in no position to defend Russian territory any longer. Just a little segue there, when you're looking at the founda foundation of the Cheka, this is a point where that links to that the, the decree, the socialist fatherland is in danger, which gave more power to the Cheka, was in response to the German invasion. Okay, tangent over, back we go. Um, and this was an incredible danger to the, to the Soviet government, so much so that they moved the capital from Petrograd, which was in very real danger of being captured by the Germans. 
to Moscow in, on the 12th of March 1918 and thereafter that's where the, the Russian government resides in the Kremlin building. Despite the fact that the German military is invading Russia, the Soviet government continues to debate the question of peace. Bukharin and his comrades couldn't agree to this idea where Lenin, it was just appalling, you know, that they were still debating this. Uh, Lenin, you know, talked uh, described this as revolutionary phrase mongering, you know, big words, but you know, what what a dangerous, irresponsible thing to say. And again, when you're looking at the role of individuals, this is a critical one for Lenin, where his force of personality holds sway in this moment. And on the 19th of February, the Soviet government contacts the German government that they're willing to accept a peace agreement incredible scenes and stress though in the, the now Kremlin as the Germans didn't reply for a further three days giving them more time to invade and take more territory uh, they gave new much more harsher terms on the 22nd of February and it took a few days March 3rd for the Soviet government to agree to these I'll talk about the impacts, the specifics of the treaty in another little video. But I really want to highlight that it was an incredibly harsh treaty, a bitter pill to swallow. It was a huge setback for Russian patriots, Russian nationalists. You know, this was a, a national humiliation and created a lot of resentment towards the Bolsheviks amongst people like, uh, you know, the cadets and the former Tsarist officers. This created an intergovernmental crisis of, as well. Trotsky flatly refused to sign the treaty and he resigned as Commissar of Foreign Affairs and took up a position of Commissar of War, which will be important when we look at the Civil War. But the left communists continued to, to ra and as did the left SRs, to rage against this decision. And it again took Lenin to slap him into line and get them to finally agree, or mm, we'll talk about who agreed or not. And, and there's this great famous quote by Lenin in, in when he's, you know, criticising those on the left on their position on the question of peace. And Lenin says, facts are stubborn things. That's a great one to use in an argument. And the facts show that Bakarin denied the possibility of a German attack and sowed illusions which actually, against his wishes, helped the German imperialists. And so he, Lenin is blaming Bukharin and Ku, as he says, for the worst uh, provisions of the treaty. So essentially what Lenin is doing is he's telling them to toughen up, pull your head in, um, shut up, we've got to get down to it, get, get down to accepting the peace and building socialism. The treaty is agreed to uh, by the Bolsheviks and it's uh, formally ratified on the 14th of March by the 4th Congress of Soviets. However, the left SRs continue to agitate against this to the point where they resign from Sovnarkom in protest of the treaty on the 19th of March 1918. And this is a very critical turning point because what that meant is Sovnarkom was no longer a socialist coalition government. It was an exclusively Bolshevik one. And so, and it will remain so from this point on. So the Treaty of brest is not just simply uh, a loss of, uh, of territory and, and, and an economic blow, it also has political repercussions. And that's where on the point we'll end with that Alexander Rabinowitch says that this was the most difficult crisis that Lenin had to deal with. So he probably needed to just get a little bit more calm into that. Namaste. So next time, that's we done. Stop.